welcome everyone to this art and activism workshop. We are delighted to be hosting this. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we uh, are holding this. It is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is their ancestors past, present, and those here with us today and emerging to whom I pay my greatest respect, their custodianship of this land is unparalleled. Unpar and that is land that uh, always was and always will be Aboriginal land, never ceded. First thing I'd like to do is to say that um, I'm sad that we couldn't have hundreds of people here in the room with us. We are still, of course, in the context of COVID. And so just a small number of us are here in the room to be part of this discussion. We are hosting this um, in the gallery in Albemarle, Albemarle, a terrific gallery which does Southeast Asian art and has a terrific activist bent. My internet um, connection is currently unstable, so I'm hoping that you can continue to hear me. Um, I see that people are um, saying hello in the chat, and we are really delighted to hear where you are coming from for this next hour. I'm going to do nothing more than just introduce the uh, next person who's going to speak. And then we are going to hear a few people speaking about this question of art and activism. So we think about when we think about um, as we can in the contact Zoom. So um, thank you so much for coming. And now who is a professor of art history at the University. Uh, I hope you can all hear this, excuse me, sorry for the feedback. Uh, my name's Mark, as uh, Susan was saying, and it's my real pleasure this afternoon to introduce our three following speakers. Um, and uh, in order, they are going to be Anne Loxley, Marty Brannigan, and Alice McGovern. And I'm going to just introduce them all uh, briefly, and then I'm going to let them flow on one from another. But I would like to first add my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to all First Nations peoples who may be on this Zoom and in this room. Um, and I'm delighted that we're here to explore the very complex question of does art equal activism or um, art and activism, a one that has many and complex answers, which I hope that you will engage with us in a uh, Q&A after the uh, three speakers have spoken. I'm gonna sort of launch a few provocations at them and then we're gonna see how the Q&A goes. But first, uh, to introduce our speakers. So our first speaker is Anne Loxley, who's Executive Director of Information Plus Cultural Exchange, which is most often known as ICE, a Western Sydney arts organization, which as you know, delivers cultural engagement to diverse communities and help co-design and making art together. And Anne is a Sydney-based curator and writer who's had worked and continues to work with contemporary artists, both inside and outside gallery contexts, and museums and communities. Um, uh, you may remember, especially, I think, with Blair French, her wonderful and important work in our context, Civic Actions, Artist Practices Beyond the Museum. And in a way, it's practice and the museum, practice beyond the museum that we're dealing with today. And uh, you will also know that Anne has had a distinguished career as director of many uh, other uh, organizations, including Penrith Regional Gallery, the Lewis Bequest, and uh, the SH Urban Gallery. And our next speaker following, um, following um, Anne will be uh, Marty Brannigan, and he's going to be speaking on the benefits of artistic activism for eco packs and social justice movements. And Marty is Senior Lecturer in Peace Studies at the University of New England, has been involved, as I think many of you will know, in artistic activism since the 1982-3 Franklin River, uh, River blockade, and utilizing a range of techniques, street theater, music, visual arts, fiction writing, and along with numerous exhibitions, uh, often and as, uh, in collaboration with artists, including indigenous artists, he's also created two um, illustrated novels, and, um, He's been inspired especially by climate activism uh, across New South Wales, but also internationally. And his academic publications include Global Warming, Militarism and Nonviolence, The Art of Active Resistance. And I think Active Resistance will be is on our, our menu this afternoon. Um, Alice McGovern, our, our final speaker uh, the, uh, the, this afternoon before we get into Q&A, um, is Associate Professor of Criminology in the School of Law, Society and Criminology, the Faculty of Law and Justice, at UNSW Sydney, I hope I got that uh, title right. She researches the themes of crime and media and culture, uh, particularly police public relations work and the police use of social media. 
and uh, particularly recently knitting graffiti and what she calls craftivism. And she's the author of Craftivism and Yarn Bombing, a Criminological Exploration, uh, which came out in 2019. And uh, in fact, her title today is Crafting Social Justice, Exploring the Relationship Between Criminology and Craftivism. So uh, without, sorry about the slightly rushed intro, but it's so we could hand you more smoothly and more fully to our speakers. So um, uh, uh, Anne will speak first. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I too pay my respects to the traditional owners of these lands, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay respect to all First Nations people um, joining us today. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'm going to start by stating that I love both activism and art. I probably know more about art. So I'll say something uh, <clears throat> hopefully sounding slightly professional about my great belief in the work of artists. And um, not only do they, because of their training and their ta talents, make things which are often uh, pleasing to experience, um, I have always found my artist colleagues to be among the most independent and critical thinkers of the people who I have the pleasure to pass time with. So, I've, and the deep ethical uh, commitments. I'm going to really meander from a few, through a few points and recollections today, which is only fitting since I've been doing what I do for more than 30 years. Um, and I'd just like to say that it's, of course, it's not simple, uh, and whether or not it equals activism. Um, one of the things in my professional life, I've been so uh, lucky to uh, work with people from different cultural backgrounds, and I've noted with some often great pain for them what they go through, that sometimes your cultural identity is in, inherently political. So that's a big statement. It's a big learning for me. Um, it's something that has often uh, been an issue actually for, for me in the curatorial work that, we under, that I've undertaken. And of course, art is about self-expression. Another really important thing is power. Power is not simple. Power can be invisible. A lot of cultural institutions are monolithic and have a whole lot of power. And unpacking that power is a tricky business. And then, of course, a lot of art, a lot of activism happens in the public domain. But if we think for a moment that the public domain is truly ours, we are naive, of course. There is always big power at play in the public domain. So the other, when I was thinking about this, I remembered an exhibition I curated in 91 and it was called Her Story, Images of Domestic Labour in Australian Art. And that was me coming from my you know, young feminist position looking at you know, why are there never any images of men doing the washing up? Why are there no images of men doing the laundry? Um, anyway, I only bring that up because we, are, we got very easily got sponsorship from the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, so I must have hit a nerve. And um, also there's that, that, there's that thing about seeing. You know, you, you, the, the way you perceive things can be uh, at least, uh, well, that, um, and it can be an act of activism. And, and the way we frame things is very powerful. Not, I don't know how powerful that was. I'd also like to remind all of us of the stellar and unparalleled work of Redback Graphics mm -hmm. and the Tin Sheds Gallery in terms of the, one of the most beautiful collisions of art and activism ever seen in, my, in our country, this country, Australia. Um, how am I going for time? Oh, excellent. Okay, so in the 90s, I happened upon a wonderful young East Timorese Australian artist called Albertina Viegas. I just thought she, her work was interesting. That's how it's always happened for me. I just think someone's got integrity, they're making great stuff, and then all of a sudden I'm in some big, often trouble. Um, and that's what happened with uh, this big project that I did with Albie and the East Timorese community in Australia called Tuberai Metan, Feet Firmly Gripping the Earth. And it sounds, this was the 90s. This was pre-Dilly Massacre. And so to be telling the story of the recent history of East Timor was 
Well, people thought I was a radical. I aspired to be a very kind of silk shirt wearing middle class curator, but that was really very hot stuff. I remember we finally got funding from the Australia Council and the general manager of the Australia Council said, oh, that's a hot potato. But it, it, my point is here we had the community, this young contemporary artist merging what she'd learned at the wonderful U U University of Western Sydney Art School, learning about Arte Povera, turning the traditional East Timorese food of Katupa into big, what are those things? But napalm things are hand grenades, are big hand grenades marking the years of occupation of East Timor. A woman, Donna Veronica Pereira, not, not from a literate culture, the, the Tetong speaking East Timorese, bothering to learn to, the alphabet to, and because over time the Dili massacre did happen to mark the names of all the people who were killed in the Dili um, cemetery that that year in the early 90s. It was just a fun, it was a strange business because as time passed, one of the speakers before talked about duration or I think the Latin for that. And by the end, from being the, the rat bags, the rat bag curator with this sort of slightly embarrassing, how can we talk about this at the moment in Australia? By the time we finished, because the exhibition toured for about six years, we had by the, the two Nobel Peace Prize winning um, <laughs> leaders from East Timor, Jose Ramos Horta and Bishop Bello, officiated the final um, venue for the exhibition. So it's, it's just a weird thing how time changes a lot of stuff. And the unique power of artists, in my opinion, to hook up with community and being the brave and fearless people that they are, to get on with what needs to be done. And that comes to my bias, I suppose, um, where I have a deep affection and deep respect for the artists who work today in the realm of social practice, uh, artists working with people on important issues. Um, here we are looking, here we are talking about artists really who are unafraid to use their remarkable skills of analysis and communication to become public thinkers on issues of great importance. I would just like to do something slightly cheesy and refer to the very famous English artist who works in this area, Jeremy Della, who I, I always use this to talk about social practice because he, he very helpfully said, I used to make things, now I make things happen. I'd like to also acknowledge um, that we're on Aboriginal land, um, the land of the, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, as we meet Gadi Eora Birong under a Sydney sky. I really want to talk about some of the research I did for the book, which Mark mentioned, um, which uh, is about the art of active resistance or the arts, um, because there are many. Uh, and my research found that the arts uh, are used in a great variety of ways, but the, the three main categorizations I found for this was um, things that are internal to the movements themselves, um, things that are external in terms of the movement talking to the public around them, um, the corporations and politicians and elites, um, and then finally holistic benefits, so things that benefited um, both the movement and what the movement was trying to do. Um, internally, from the very beginning of, of a movement, uh, it breaks the ice with things like songs and dance and role plays and games, just to get people to get to know each other, to, um, to form affinity groups. Uh, and then things like music can help to build solidarity so that you feel welded to the movement. You feel like you've got loyalty to your, your colleagues and, and comrades within it. Um, and music can also help if you're facing an arrest situation, for example, or something that's very confronting, even walking down a street with a group of people. Um, people have said that if they're holding a, a puppet or a banner, they feel like they are occupied and that 
Um, they're not quite as nervous as they would be otherwise. Um, music can also inspire people to act. So an example of this was at the um, anti-Uranian blockade in Roxby Downs, South Australia, back in the 80s, where someone drove a car up to the gates to play a Midnight Oil album, 109876, the, the fantastic protest album back then. Um, and people were inspired to sit down. It, it gave them the, the courage to resist, to, um, to get arrested and thereby get media coverage. Uh, the arts, like stickers and badges, things you wear um, on your bags, on, on your shirts, um, stickers on the back of your car. You can see someone pull up into a, a country town, as I did recently in Canamble, um, and saw that these people were part of the Lock the Gate movement. So we were able to engage in a, in a conversation and further build these networks. Um, so the arts are um, great at growing movements. Of, at, inclusivity of bringing uh, children into them, and bringing elderly people into them. Um, the knitting nanas, for example, one woman uh, recently commented that it's not about the knitting. The knitting is just a cover. It's, it's their, their camouflage to, to protest outside um, politicians' offices or uh, corporations that are engaged in supporting fossil fuels. Uh, in terms of movement sustainability, the arts can help you to avoid burnout. Um, if you're doing the one thing all the time, it's very confronting and, and difficult. Um, and people very quickly do burn out. But if you've got banners to make, if you've got paper mache puppets to, to make, if you can do keep a visual arts diary or whatever, it's some other way of engaging your mind. Um, and this is important also in what the movement's trying to do outside to these audiences. That you can give all the, the impassioned speeches, you can give all the dire facts about um, global warming or the, or the nuclear threat. It's probably gonna move people a lot more if you do it with a song and a dance or with some form of creativity or, or humor so that you're, you're not in instantly putting people offside. You're trying to draw them into some dialogue. Um, you also create tangible assets or artifacts that, um, you know, if you spend a lot of your time on the computer or in an office, you can't see any, anything, you know, you, you might wonder, have I achieved anything today? But if you have a sketch or a, a work of beauty, um, and I think here of, of Benny Zabel's wonderful props, Benny's a, an artist who's been um, working on, on the sh a shoestring for decades. And he creates these incredible anti-nuclear barrels and banners and wears these costumes. And you can now see these um, in the um, National Museum um, of Australia and various other museums. So people can come along, see these artifacts and then um, get involved in, in discourses and, and understand what the issues are. Um, speaking of, Art museums. I recently came across this, um, the protest stencil toolkit. So art is, is getting professional. This was in the, the main gallery in Canberra. Um, it's extraordinary that you can, you can pick something up here as I did for my, my daughter who's in Extinction Rebellion. Um, and, and so, um, have I got another minute or so? Um, externally, that the arts can attract attention, they can engage people, they can communicate efficiently uh, and communicate on a range of levels. So not just physical, uh, not just intellectual, but physical and emotional um, and so on. And there's a lot of evidence that um, the arts in education are very effective. Um, in community development, they're very effective. So we can presume that they're very effective also um, in artistic activism. Um, and, and finally, uh, the arts can balance the no of protest with the yes of, of life and celebration so that um, you're not just out there being negative, you're trying to celebrate what is wonderful about our world and all the, all the great things that are going on all the time um, amidst all the doom and gloom that we read about. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll finish it up there and I'm sure we can get into some more things later. Yes. 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 Yes.
I'm good. <laughs> I'd just like to acknowledge you're on the lands of the Gadigal people and I'd like to thank them for their custodianship of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present and any uh, Indigenous people who might be joining us today. Uh, so it's nice to follow on from Marty actually because there's quite a few things that he spoke about that kind of resonate with some of the work that I've been doing. Um, as a criminologist, people are often confused as why uh, as to why a criminologist is interested in uh, looking at activism, and um, particularly my area of interest is in craftivism, uh, which is craft activism. And I'm just going to see if I can share some slides because I think uh, some of the images will help uh, give some context to what I'm talking about. So um, I'm an amateur crafter um, and my entree into craftism actually came through a personal desire to find more time to craft and um, I became aware of the practice of yarn bombing which is essentially a form of knitting graffiti and uh, it was through looking at that um, and understanding, trying to, trying to understand why yarn bombing or knitting graffiti is different to other forms of graffiti that I became aware of craftivism. And uh, craftivism is a relatively recent term. It was popularised in the early 2000s by Betsy Greer, who's a, a crafter and a writer. Um, I've got the, one of the definitions of craftivism on the screen there. And um, really what uh, brought me to this is that I was really fascinated by the way in which craft could be a way to engage um, in kind of gentle forms of activism, which is kind of similar to what um, Marty was talking about with the knitting nanas against gas, a way of kind of um, softly introducing people to uh, issues and topics that uh, uh, politically, you know, might people might not necessarily agree with them on or not know much about, and it's a, it's a nice way to kind of engage people. So my, my research into crafterism uh, has led me more specifically to look at the ways in which craft is being used to address social justice issues and in particular issues around and concerns around the criminal justice system. So um, what I've ended up kind of being really interested in is thinking about the ways in which craft, um, which is slightly distinctive from forms of art, I suppose. I mean, craft has a, a slightly different history or, sorry, it's not necessarily different history, but the way it's perceived is often different from uh, other forms of art. And uh, I think it allows uh, a greater range of people perhaps to engage in um, practices that, uh, I guess, democratise uh, conversations around uh, social justice issues. So one particular area I've been interested in is uh, looking at the ways in which craft can challenge uh, state power, acts of crafterism can challenge state power. I've got a, a few examples um, here that demonstrate uh, some contemporary examples of crafterism. Uh, collective projects, uh, one being the Knit Your Revolt tricycle gang uh, in Queensland who were uh, trying to make a statement about Queensland's anti-bikey legislation uh, in, 26, in 2015, sorry. And uh, they were really trying to point out some of the, the contradictions in some of the legislation uh, by crafting themselves as a tricycle gang with colours and with badges, as you can see um, uh, on the screen here, patches, sorry, uh, to kind of play up some of the, the concerns that they had around uh, how this, might, this law legislation might be impacting on human rights. Uh, in the US, there's a group called the Social Justice Sewing Academy, uh, which is also using craft as a way to engage with issues of social justice. Uh, they tackle issues such as Black Lives Matter, gun violence, uh, police brutality, and they do this through workshops that they hold with young people where they create crafted quilt blocks, which are then sewn together to make quilts that are put on public display. Um, to give young people a voice around the social justice concerns that they have. Um, they've also recently established the Memorial Quilt Project. Um, so this is a quilt where families of people who've been lost to violence um, will have a banner made in their honour. Um, and uh, they also create activist banners for local and national organisations as well. And the challenging state power, is the embroidered collective 
across Chile, uh, who emerged in the path of protests um, against subway fares in Chile in late 19, uh, 2019. Uh, during the protests, a number of uh, people uh, received eye injuries from uh, encounters that they had during uh, clashes with police. And so as a response uh, to this, two uh, women who are embroiderers, uh, Lillian Urzua and illustrator Maria Ignacio Jerez, uh, invited people to stitch the image of the injuries. They received 870 points together into what you can see uh, part of a 23-point drive, which is displayed um, in museums, uh, in the Museum of Memory in Chile. And it's kind of, uh, it, it's evocative of some of the work of the, the Aparillas, Apuleras in uh, Chile as well, responding to the dictatorship of Pinochet. Um, Craft can also be used to, as, a, as a way of uh, memorializing and remembering um, individuals. So uh, missing and murdered uh, individuals in Mexico, for example, are memorialized through the work of the Red Fountains. Uh, who use handkerchiefs and embroidery as a way to raise awareness of people who've been murdered and missing. Uh, and then two, uh, two examples in Canada, the Walking With Our Sisters and the We Care, we Care Quilt have also been uh, used to raise awareness around um, violence against Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. So these are just a couple of examples in which uh, crafts can be used to... Um, I guess help people remember, but also to raise awareness as well. Um, and the interesting thing about the Walking With Our Sisters um, commemorative project as well is that there's also um, uh, an attempt to disrupt uh, the usual settings of museums as well in the way that that particular um, exhibition was uh, was crafted throughout particular museums in Canada. And really uh, centered on the work of, centered on art. Elders um, and elders are of particular communities really trying to play a central role in how those particular exhibitions played out in galleries. And finally, um, craft is also being used to raise awareness around gendered violence and sexual violence. Uh, one high profile example is the monument quilt uh, in the US, which was initiated by FORCE, um, a collective in the US. And they held a series of quilt making workshops uh, in the US and Mexico. To, and the idea was to provide support uh, around survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence. So they created quilt blocks, uh, which were then crafted into over three, so there's over 3,000 quilt blocks that were crafted into um, larger quilts. And you can see in the images there um, being put on display in Washington, D.C.'s National Board. Knowledge, the victimization or the survivorship, but also to try and disrupt public discourse on sexual violence. And then more recently, I actually haven't had a chance to go out and see if it's on this year. I believe it is. Um, out in Blacktown for the last three or four years, Blacktown Council has had an exhibition uh, in the local town square um, around domestic violence. So um, held during 16 days of activism. And so uh, people from around the local area uh, knit objects which is are then um, attached to trees and various um, public uh, objects as a visual display of um, challenging uh, domestic violence. So I guess just to kind of conclude, I guess my what I'm really interested here is in the ways in which craft can be mobilized for political or activist ends. And um, a lot of the research on craftism speaks about the way in which the process of making and creating can be a way that uh, both the, the creators but also audiences can consider issues more deeply. Uh, it's often referred to as a form of gentle activism. Uh, so Sarah Corbett's work in the Crafters Collective here has uh, really spoken about the way in which craft allows people to engage in difficult and sensitive topics and gives a voice to, to victim survivors. Um, but I, I should acknowledge too that even though this is a relatively new term, the practice of craftism has been happening for many centuries um, as well. So it's important that we kind of acknowledge also the historical context and the way in which it's been used, uh, particularly by marginalised groups, to 
uh, challenge or resist or to kind of comment on a range of social issues. So I'll finish there. Right, I hope you can read lips. Uh, 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 I, um, I was just saying that the slightly longer pauses than normal are due to the fact that we are sort of uh, trying to patrol our own feedback, so to speak, um, uh, in this in this uh, room uh, in which we're all sitting. So there might there might be a slightly more awkward pause than normal in Zoom land between one of us speaking and another. And I just like to thank all our speakers. And I think um, my job here is to sort of push our conversation on and induce you all to put a, um, a question in the Q and A by a sort of asking our speakers to reflect after their very considered and thoughtful and, and very passionate discussions of their own experiences with art and activism. On the larger questions that we asked, um, does art equal activism? Does activism work? Is it a, uh, an, a new front in social and cultural um, uh, community self-expression? Or is it a distraction from the proper work of the political and cultural debate, as some have said. So these are difficult questions. Other ones we might um, and might try to consider is, is the museum a place where activism goes to die? Is can, can art be activist in its museum context or must it be in the community in an active role in order to be uh, considered activist art? Is there sort of a, a sort of mortuary experience that exists when an artist, even a Jeremy Della, who was mentioned at the time, becomes institutionalized or captured or in some way repurposed by a larger uh, sort of, if you like, cultural world? So these are big questions for us all, but I think that the best people to answer those may be uh, uh, our speakers and those uh, who've had the longest careers with it. I, I pose, but maybe I'd ask our speakers to you know, maybe a gentler question is, how do we know art as activism, craftism works? What are the ways that we could tell that it might be having an effect? And in what ways might we challenge ourselves? Or what, what might the due diligence be that says, you know, does this work? So maybe, uh, I don't know who would like to go first, but whomever, I shall, um, I shall unjoin audio and... Uh, yeah. The number of times that I've been in the gallery and seen the most um, truthful, brave ideas being expressed, and I feel very anxious, oh, cranky, actually, that it's only other kind of <clears throat> middle-class people who like going to galleries that are going to get the message, it is a thing of great pain to me. I love seeing activist art in the public domain. Art in the gallery does have a place and I do think time is a really important thing in all of this about changing messages. But it's, I think it is much more effective outside the gallery. And as for how you measure it, um, well, you a brave person, I suppose. I had the pleasure of working with Diego Bonetto and um, the artists of Branch Nebula on a project in Liverpool in Western Sydney where we were trying to um, make some impact on the injustices around food insecurity and really what we were trying to do is with a lot of social issues of course people feel shame and there's not enough vocabulary for people to be able to talk about difficult things in a way where, which is not agonizing and hurtful and shameful and so with wonderful artists that is one of the things I've found again and again in socially engaged practice is that because of their way of seeing and their skills as communicators, their skills as thinkers, difficult things become more palatable. And we definitely were able to raise awareness of that very difficult issue in a way that was constructive. Um, I did a big project on schizophrenia and that was very similar, like the pain of people who've been touched by schizophrenia. Of course, the irony is so many of us love people with that illness or like any other mm. illness that we have. But again, that was a really, it was so much about, for one thing, artists see pe people as people. They're not an illness or they're not a person with a social problem. And then they have this unique um, creative skill sets and critical ways of thinking so that we do reframe them. And um, so I, I do, I have, feel I have seen great change. I've worked in Blacktown with the Darug people. 
on um, issues around stolen generation. And in the beginning, it was so hard talking to people who weren't, didn't know, who hadn't experienced stolen generation because um, literally a media person told me it was a bad news story. Um, so, it, uh, and it's back to the craft, craftivism and back to the, the art forms that you were talking about, Marty. It's artists and art help us stay in the space with these difficult issues as well. And they do change our time. Thanks. I'd, I'd like to add to that, um, that um, not necessarily uh, on a huge scale, but just some small scale examples of, of what the arts can do. Um, and I was mentioned yarn bombing. Um, my daughter and her friend did some yarn bombing um, about seven years ago, and, and the yarn has only just fallen off the tree. Um, but the day after they, they yarn bombed this tree, uh, a young man came out from his house and he saw the yarn bombing and he went over and hugged the tree. It, it was just beautiful. Um, some examples from protest movements, um, a bloke called Jeremy Bradley was, was part of a, a group um, at the Chalandi Old Growth Forest Blockades in the 1990s, who engaged in street theatre and music. Um, and while all the, the ferals with the, you know, the obvious protesters were being arrested, he was never arrested. And that's great for his physical and, and mental and financial well-being, that he can float in and out of these spaces of contestion without being dragged off and having to pay a whole lot of money to, to regain their freedom. Um, and one final example is, is the role of, of music in preventing violence. Um, there was a very clear example of that at the Franklin River when a, a group of um, dam workers approached the, um, the Greenies um, with the intent of oh, perhaps engaging in violence. They were certainly very angry. Um, and a couple of very brave musicians got out and played music in front of the whole crowd um, and calmed down the situation. And in the end, some of these, these dam workers came and had a cup of tea with some of the women and, and um, engaged in some dialogue and, and got to know each other. Um, a similar thing happened in Armadale outside the police station where um, some Aboriginal people had been incarcerated there was a, possibly a riot looming outside because so many people were so angry about, you know, the continuation of um, injustice. Um, and some women elders began a song that, again, effectively calmed down the crowd um, so that, the, you know, there, there weren't violent outcomes. And I think that's important if you're um, opposing structural violence and cultural violence um, and direct violence, then it's great to ensure that your actions remain non-violent. Okay, I think my audio is working. Um, I guess, and this sort of, to some degree, uh, feeds it back into one of the questions that's in the, the Q&A around how do, you, how do you help people? I mean, I, th I think different projects will have different impacts on individuals. So if I think about some of the, the projects that I spoke about, the Monument Quilt, Part of that was about having victim survivors come together to, to work on their, their creations together. I think also, so, so there's that kind of individual level impact, but I think also too that being able to share these um, creations publicly uh, can, uh, I guess, perhaps put pressure on politicians perhaps or, or other key stakeholders to... Uh, to at least respond to the kinds of questions that might be being asked of them or the kinds of issues that might be being raised. And I think, you know, when I, when I look at some of the work that crafters have been doing, um, th this is a big debate in the craftivism community, you know, is it, is it just making kind of crafted objects or is it actually having an impact? Is it actually doing anything? Um, and I think there's a whole range of there's no right answer on that. I think there's a whole range of perspectives on whether if it has an effect on the individual, whether that is something uh, that, that's enough. Um, for example, I've been looking at some uh, research around craftivism in relation to the fashion industry. There's a big movement around the mending and uh, recycling and uh, reuse of, of um, clothing. And one of the, the debates is, well, if it might not make any impact on the, the fashion industry and the broader issues that need to be addressed there, but 
it might, if it changes your own personal um, actions, it allows you to reflect on your own consumption and, uh, you know, fast fashion and your own use of fast fashion, then, you know, that small change might be, um, might be enough. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, uh, uh, our, our questioner in the Q&A asked a very direct question about how art is, is, can be, can address violence, domestic violence, the rape of women, the use of violence in, uh, you know, a variety of contexts. And these are hard questions because, you know, some would might say, actually, it is the proper position of law and the rule of law to address these questions. But we know that we live slightly worryingly, increasingly less able to trust the rule of law to uh, address many of the injustice and indeed violence issues of our time. And so in a way, I, I wonder whether um, you have some thoughts on, you know, I, I asked a slightly provocative question about, is it art's role to do this? Why, what, what is the ethical position of art and art making vis-a-vis -vis these large sort of questions of injustice uh, and, and my, my I suppose the concern I had was is there a kind of smokescreen not a smokescreen exactly but a kind of diversion from the proper addressing of the deep structural issues you know with it, the old-fashioned you know revolutionary rhetoric which used to used to say this is all froth you need to address key issues but I, I, I'm imagining that in fact we have thought through those answers, and I wondered what you what you would think uh, if someone said to you, "But you know, this is all a waste of time. Get where it's supposed to be." Um, Thanks, Mark. I would really like to talk about that because I want to get a I want to get a project up about domestic violence because just like as you referred to, Alice, you know, what there are there are community projects all through Sydney about DV, like, and we know it's bad. We know it's extra bad after the pandemic. I'm I'm deeply worried about it and um, I'm trying to get something going but there's been lovely talk today about the wonderful colleagues in Indonesia and I'd like to just bring to your attention a brilliant feminist collective that operates out of Jakarta called Intersastra and they've done a really big project on domestic violence called the House of the Unsilenced and it it touches me deeply because um, they got all these people who were survivors of DV and they worked very carefully with appropriate artists. There was, um, well, you know, counsellors in the room and stuff because you have to be very careful when they're going towards traumatic material. But obviously the power of placing an exhibition told by the survivors in the domestic setting, like it, it is massive. And I'd like to then go from that example back to the kind of process question that you raised. And that is, you know, when you're doing this kind of work, I, I was working this morning on uh, with one of my team on this thing we're trying to do about cultural safety. It's so heavy at the moment to get the cultural safety stuff right. And there's this phrase about proximity to lived experience as a notion of that. So. Uh, I can't tell the story about my friend who I had a cup of tea with who told me her terrible story. It has to be her story. Uh, there's a, you know, it, the, the, the stories need to come from, from the people who've experienced the lived experience and the, and the structures need to be safe. And, um, and, and, some, and of course, people in the thick of that space the, a bad thing are probably not the people that you want to work with on the art, but the people who have got through it can be really powerful, um, you know, make really powerful work. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's tricky to, to work out exactly what is the role and what is the effectiveness of art um, in these sort of contexts, um, because the arts can be very much part of the establishment. They were very much part of the, you know, the um, totalitarian regimes in, in Russia and, and Germany. Um, and we still see these days um, very persuasive advertising on TV for four-wheel drives. Um, Australia is one of the, the highest users of four-wheel drives, these giant four-wheel drives that people are using to drive between Mossman and, and Balmoral. Um, and this is normalised in a, in a time of, uh, of global warming and, and extinction um, crises. Uh, so the arts can be very much 
part of the, the status quo, but it can also challenge it. And I think one of the things we can do is, is in our work in, in every aspect of our lives, we can challenge violence. We can challenge ecological violence of, of global warming as, as the candles people are doing in the regions. Uh, art is in all the regions. It's not just in the city, it's, it's all over. Um, and I think if we're gonna challenge all these forms of violence, we need to do it in a very, um, a way that, that's gonna be effective and a way that's um, gonna create synergisms of people working together um, in whatever area they have expertise. We can't just rely on politicians to solve domestic violence problems. It's gotta be um, particularly uh, men changing probably more than anything, but also society challenging the militarism that so dominates us. You know, the, the huge amounts of money we're throwing into the military every year. And when we, you know, is it actually achieving anything other than destroying the planet? I, I'm, excuse me, I'm just popping back uh, slightly uh, belatedly. I wanted to uh, follow up um, um, a, a Q&A comment from um, and all this in, the, in, in our Q&A that you can measure um, the effectiveness or uh, like you can of whistleblowers by how much they're persecuted. And in fact, I mean, it's a terrible index of the effectiveness of activist art that we are in a position right now around the world where there are thousands of artists of one type or another in prison and where, you know, in Belarus, uh, artists are being beaten to death and where, um, in, in other words, it, it's a sort of frightening index of, you know, the repression of the artists, but it is also a sign um, of the fact that it seems that um, art making of one diverse kind or another seems to get under the skin of certain regimes who really find it a, 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 a barrier they can't cross or, or a, a, a something to be repressed. So, I mean, yes, I think, I think Anne's point is that uh, in a way, it's a grim measure of the success of art's ability to persuade and to change minds and to change opinions that um, artists have been particularly targeted over. Um, but, but I was kind of keen to, you know, to probe a little bit on that, uh, um, something that, um, that Marty just said about artists, um, that art writ large hasn't always had a glorious um, sort of history of opposition to power, but has but has been in in, 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 in across uh, you know particularly the last thirty years associated with the very kind of structures of the one percent that have come to so dominate our lives. Is there a way of squaring this, or is that just sort of you know, do we have to sort of uncapitalize art and, I mean, literally, you know, refuse a notion of art in order to sort of free ourselves for a more activist future? Or is there something, you know, that was held up by the, the traditions in which I used to teach, you know, the social history of art, which rather said, no, uh, you know, if you, if you look at it right, David Marat is a great and wonderful uh, piece of political activism, or even Malevich's Black Square can be seen as, or, or, or in a way, are we able to deal with art uh, in, in post its incorporation into the 1%? I, I don't know if that's too big a question, but if anyone wants to try and answer it. So art, being expensive stuff valued and owned and loved by the one percent and even within that let's stick with that the art that's being loved and bought and artists living rich off the fat of the one percent um but some of that art has really caustic messages i remember I, the one artist that comes quickly to mind is richard bell of course <laughs> Um, couldn't be more caustic and, and there they are lovely acquirable things that are indeed acquired a lot by, by public collections and by private collections. Um, I'm not going to say anything judgmental about the art that's owned by the 1% that perhaps doesn't have an activist message like Courses for courses, I suppose. Everyone has their own choices. But there is with, within the, on the spectrum of arts practice, there's the people that are making the stuff and the, and the stuff that gets sold. And then there's 
like the, there's all kinds of other stuff like there's video art which sometimes is very expensive but then there's the non-object based practice some of the social practitioners um who are really doing the heavy lifting when it, in in the activism and in the making the world a better place space and I know where I want to be as a curator and I know who I want to hang around with as a human being most of the time but you know it's I, I'm not going to be a totalitarian I'll just join in there and just um, um, following on from your comment, Mark, um, that there's a saying attributed often to Gandhi, but I think it was probably used by um, unions in the USA before that, that um, uh, first you're ignored um, and then they laugh at you and then they fight you and then you win. That's the usual stages of, of a campaign. Um, I, I think... I, uh, sometimes emerges out of extraordinary circumstances. And I, I think of a movement that I'm, I'm very influenced by, which is Dada um, and surrealism, which is shared with it. Um, it came out of the, the slaughter of the First World War. Um, and it was an extraordinary reaction to those times. And I think we saw a bit more of an explosion of extraordinary art in, in the 1960s in the struggle um, against the Vietnam War. and. Um, also the civil rights movements um, and women going into galleries and occupying them to say, well, why, why are the only women in here nude ones on the, on the walls? Why aren't the women artists being represented? Um, one of the contemporary artists I, I really enjoy is Banksy, um, who began as a street artist. Um, and now his, his works are being sold for huge amounts of money. And then just as they're sold, um, he shreds them. I don't know if you saw that thing where he had a remote control shredder. It had just been bought at Sotheby's for some huge amount and then he pushed the button and the whole painting got shredded. So he's, he's really doing some extraordinary stuff. But at the same time, people complain about him uh, gentrifying suburbs. If you've got a Banksy on your wall, then everyone's going to start paying a lot more in that suburb. So you can you can never get things perfectly right you're always going to offend someone uh, that's not going to be perfect it's that uncertainty that, that we've spoken about earlier about art i think sometimes you just have to go for it right last bit of uh, uh lip reading class for the day um i i'm sort of slightly horrified looked at looked at the time and it is 4 29 and, and i really want to say uh, a, a big thanks to our speakers i'm there, these are many questions. These are unanswered questions, but believe me, they're questions that absorb our curator friends at the art galleries, uh, us as colleagues who are trying to teach art. What should we teach? How do we teach it? Artists making art, curators everywhere. These are our, these are preoccupying questions and ones which I think are going to exercise our minds across many disciplines for uh, a long time to come. But right now, I have to say goodbye and thank you, first of all, um, to Alice, to Marty. And, um, and to Anne, but especially to our convener today, uh, Susan Banke, whose interest in art activism and the movement of uh, migrants, who's right here with me indeed, um, uh, has really spurred this, and to John Purvis and the gallery for letting us be here, and to all of you for your, um, uh, your questions, your sometimes difficult questions, but also for your attention today. So thank you to everybody, and uh, I think this is where we have to say goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>